Welcome to Basic Fruit Production. This is an introductory learning module on the basics of small fruit and tree fruit production. The first half of this module will cover general production practices common to both small fruit and tree fruit. And the second half will emphasize crop specific needs using apple and peach as examples. This module is designed to cover the basics of fruit production, including the components for good site selection, the selection of cultivar and rootstocks, the steps in the planting process, the importance of training and pruning, and finally, crop load management, which is also simply referred to as thinning. Fruit growing is challenging and requires significant time on the grower's part to manage successfully. Because many fruit crops are long-lived, considerable time should be invested into understanding proper site selection, soil preparation, and planting plants to avoid costly mistakes that are difficult to correct once plants are in the ground. Before ordering plants, one should also learn about their pollination needs, their susceptibility to pests, and understand whether your plants are winter hardy and adapted to your site. Fruit plants are most productive if you carefully match them with the proper planting site, which in general is a site that is not susceptible to frost, receives full sunlight, has fertile, well-drained moisture retentive soils, and is weed free. Having said that, very few sites are naturally ideal. To create a successful site, begin at least one year ahead of planning to overcome problems like poor drainage, low soil organic matter, poor soil fertility, lack of water supply, or establish weeds or other problematic pests. In the flower, Pollination is a transfer of pollen from the anther to the stigma. After pollination and fertilization, fruit set occurs. There are two types of pollination. Self-pollination occurs when the pollen is transferred from the anther to the stigma on the same flower, from another flower on the same plant, or from a flower on another plant of the same cultivar. Self-pollinated plants are said to be self-fruitful. Many plants cannot produce fruit from their own pollen and are considered self-unfruitful. These plants require cross-pollination for fruit set. Cross-pollination is a transfer of pollen from one plant to the flower of a genetically different plant or cultivar. Note that even when cross-pollination is not essential, it usually does improve the number and or size of fruit that forms. Pollination is an important factor when selecting and planting tree fruit and small fruit. A list of generalized pollination requirements for the various fruits is presented here. On the previous slide, generalities about fruitfulness were listed for different fruit, but understand exceptions commonly occur among cultivars of a particular fruit. For those listed in the self-unfruitful group, many exceptions do occur. Take apple, for example. Many apples are self-unfruitful, but there are cultivars that are partially self-fruitful, fully self-fruitful, and also cultivars that are pollen sterile. Most nursery catalogs provide information about fruitfulness and which cultivars are recommended for pollinating each other. With strawberries, blueberries, apples, plums, and sweet cherries, insects carry the pollen from flower to flower. In other words, insects are the pollinator for these crops. Some fruits, such as grapes and peaches, rely on gravity or wind currents to carry pollen from their anthers to the pistil. Heavy rains during bloom can interfere with pollen distribution or insect activity. Seed formation will be poor if pollination is inadequate, and seed formation is essential for the growth and development of most fruits. Voles, deer, and birds are the three major vertebrate pests of fruit plantings. Voles are mouse-like mammals that eat the bark and roots of young fruit trees and thornless blackberries in winter and are frequently a serious problem. Deer consume the new shoots of fruit trees. Birds damage the fruits of blueberry, cherry, gooseberry, and grape plantings. Uneven precipitation can cause plant stress during critical growth periods which will affect both crop productivity and fruit quality. Most fruit crops require irrigation to minimize plant stress. Proper timing of water applications during appropriate periods can increase the yield and quality of most fruit crops in Illinois in most years. 
Drip and overhead irrigation are the most common throughout Illinois. Overhead irrigation can also be used to provide frost protection for certain small fruit, particularly strawberries. A properly designed and operated sprinkler system can provide frost protection for strawberries down to 22 degrees Fahrenheit or lower. Due to the poor anchorage or brittle graft unions, many grafted dwarf apple trees require support in the form of a trellis system and or an individual post. Other fruit crops that require trellis are semi-erect blackberries and grapes. Consider thoroughly which cultivars to plant. The first consideration is to determine how you intend to sell the fruit. Remember, marketing, marketing, marketing. Roadside markets, pick your own, and to some extent, wholesale fresh market growers all need a continual supply of products. Therefore, it is important to choose cultivars that will accommodate an extended marketing period. Information about various cultivars and their ripening sequence can be found in nursery catalogs. But keep in mind the dates in the catalog may need adjustment to fit your local climate. Cultivars also differ in the susceptibility to pest. But remember, the most pest resistant are not always the best tasting. Fruit and or cultivars can also differ in their adaptability to a particular planting site. For example, raspberries are usually more suited to the northern part of the state than the southern, unless you plan to grow them in a high tunnel. Several cultivars have been found to be very suitable for high tunnel production in the southern portion of the state. Certain cultivars of apples perform better in the north than in the south. Take for example Macintosh. A Macintosh tree will grow fine in southern Illinois, but is more suited to cooler climates, so there is an issue with fruit drop and mealy fruit texture when grown in the south. Before setting out large plantings of a new strain or cultivar, always plant a few plants on a trial basis. Also, try to visit or talk to growers who may already have bearing fruit of a particular cultivar. Although all fruit crops have similar but respective cultural needs, tree fruit are generally considered the most demanding. For the sake of time and focus, peach and apple will be used to demonstrate specific cultural needs. To start off, fruit trees vary in the susceptibility to winter cold injury. Apples typically are least likely damaged by winter or late spring frost, while apricots and sweet cherries are most susceptible, primarily because of their very early bloom. Other stone fruits and pears are intermediate in their susceptibility to cold injury. Apples are grown commercially throughout Illinois, whereas peaches are limited commercially to roughly south of Interstate 70 and a bit north as you approach the Mississippi River. Rootstocks for apple trees are special apple varieties that control the height of the tree and give it other special characteristics, such as resistance to insects or diseases, solid anchorage in the ground, and early fruit production. A cultivar is grafted onto this special rootstock, so you are essentially buying two plants, the rootstock that anchors the tree and the cultivar that produces the fruit. Pictured above is an apple cultivar grafted onto a non-dwarfing rootstock for size comparison. Peach rootstocks, on the other hand, have been selected more for their tolerance to stresses than for their size control. Some of the stresses may include root knot nematode, calcareous soils, water logging, soil hardiness, and peach tree short life. Selecting an apple rootstock is just as important as selecting the cultivar that will be grafted to it. Rootstock cultivars differ in pest susceptibility, tolerance to certain growing conditions, productivity, growth characteristics, and overall nursery adoption. Both rootstock and cyan cultivar affect the ultimate size of an apple tree. As shown above, the rootstock can affect branch angle, but also has an effect on precocity and longevity of the tree. Trees on the most dwarfing rootstock may need staking to keep them upright. Peaches are almost exclusively available on seedling peach rootstock, which means there is no dwarfing effect. Almost all peach rootstocks are suitable for lighter, well-drained, sandy, loamy soils. They do not tolerate wet conditions or wet, poorly drained soils. 
Mounding of planting sites or raised beds created for a better drain soil condition will help prolong tree life and reduce winter injury from the late hardening off in the fall. Pictured here is an example of a fully mature, commercially pruned peach tree on a non-dwarfing rootstock. To increase your chance of success, buy high quality plants from a reliable nursery. The most commonly sold stock are one half inch diameter, bare root, one year old whips. A whip refers to a single unbranched stem. Nurseries sometimes sell two-year-old trees that may have several branches, sometimes called feathers. These two types of stock usually perform better than larger and older trees because small trees are easier to transplant and train to a desired shape. When ordering, request that plants arrive before growth is started to prevent damage from shipping. Pictured here are an example of a feathered tree on the left and a whip on the right. Early spring is the best time to plant fruit trees. Plant as soon as you can after the soil has thawed and drained enough to work without destroying its structure and before your nursery stock starts to break bud and leaf out. It is best to prepare the soil the year before planting, getting you prepared and ready to plant before plants arrive from the nursery. Improper care after plants arrive from the nursery can cause serious injury. Make every effort to set the plants in their permanent location before growth starts. You can store plants in a walk-in cooler for a short time before planting or healing in, but do not store them in coolers with ripening fruit, which gives off ethylene gas that can damage the nursery stock. Before you plant trees, trim off broken or injured roots. Do not let the roots dry out. Plants can die if roots are exposed to sun and wind. You may want to soak the roots in a pail of clean, cool water for 6 to 12 hours before planting. Dig planting holes large enough to accommodate the tree roots in their natural position. Put aside the topsoil so you can replace it after planting. Plant rootstocks with a graft union 2 to 3 inches above ground level. If the graft union is below the soil line, roots may develop on the base of the scion cultivar, which is the upper portion of the graft, which results in the loss of the effect of the rootstock. Carefully spread the roots over the loose soil in the bottom of the hole. Move the tree up and down slightly as you spread the first few shovels of topsoils back on top of the roots. This helps to settle the soil under and around the roots and gets rid of air spaces. Tamp the soil firmly while filling the hole. Water trees immediately after planting and water at weekly intervals for four to five weeks unless rainfall is adequate. When planting a large number of trees, it may be more efficient to plant with a tree auger or a tree planter. When augering the hole, make sure the sides of the holes do not develop a glazed skin. This glazing can act as an artificial barrier to root penetration as the tree roots grow, resulting in a pot-bound tree. If glazing is observed, score the side of the hole with a shovel to increase root penetration. Most large commercial growers utilize a tree planter and is probably the easiest method to plant trees. There are two major checkpoints in this system. One, Make sure the union is set at the proper height. This is usually accomplished by having someone go behind the planter and pull up or push down the tree. Two, make sure the tree roots do not dry out. Carry only enough trees that when you plant the last tree, the roots still have some moisture. Training and pruning are two different aspects of modifying the natural growth patterns of a fruit tree. Whereas training focuses on tree development, Pruning is used to maintain tree function and size. Training takes place usually in the first four to five years of the tree life, whereas pruning is done throughout the life of the tree. Early on, pruning is used to control excessive vigor, but in declining years, pruning is used to invigorate and increase light penetration into the canopy. There are a number of training systems for both apple and peach. The central leader and open center are the most common in Illinois in low density orchards and will be used in this module as an introduction to training systems. A tree trained to a central leader has one main upright growing stem called the central leader with four to seven main scaffold branches evenly spaced around the trunk. On larger trees, secondary scaffolds higher up on the main leader would also be allowed to develop. 
Heading back, unbranch new trees, also known as a whip, to 30 inches will bring the top and roots back into balance and cause buds just below the cut to grow and form scaffold branches. Cutting below 24 inches will result in excessive vegetative growth. Cutting too high, 36 inches, will result in weak growth in the top of the tree as well as in lower areas. The new shoots will be vigorous and upright growing with very narrow crotch angles. To prevent this, you need to force the new shoots to a more horizontal growth pattern using a branch spreading method. After a year of growth, head the central leader about one third the length of the new shoot that grew the first year. Several shoots should develop just below the heading cut. If the first set of scaffolds is vigorous and begins to grow too upright, they should be spread using one of several methods to a 45 to 60 degree angle. A tree trained to an open center has no main leader, but several main scaffolds that branch out from approximately the same height of the tree. Peaches and nectarines are often trained to open centers. With unbranched trees, also known as whips, cut the tree at 26 to 30 inches above the ground after planting. The scaffold branches will develop within 4 to 6 inches below the cut. If you purchase a tree with healthy branches located 15 to 30 inches above the soil line, select three or four branches, one at each of the compass points. Choose branches that initially develop from the main axis at a 60 to 90 degree angle. Cut them back by one half to a healthy outward facing bud. Remove all branches that are less than 15 inches above the soil line and cut the tree off just above the topmost selected scaffold. During the summer, pinch off any shoots that begin to grow towards the center of the tree. At the end of the first summer, trees should begin to take on a typical open base shape. Three or four permanent scaffold limbs should be selected at this time and the others removed. The permanent or primary scaffolds chosen should be distributed evenly around the trunk, approximately six inches apart vertically. Small side branches along the scaffold can be left for early fruiting. Do not select primary scaffold limbs that are directly above one another. The limbs selected should have an angle of 60 to 90 degrees from vertical. Picture to the left is a depiction of a whip tree that has been headed back to start the open center training system. The top views show the selection of scaffold limbs on each of the compass points. Pictured here are peach trees in different stages of the open center training system. The left hand picture shows a feathered tree that has been headed back to the open center training system. Trees will grow much faster if grass and weeds over the root zone are removed. Mulch can be placed around the tree if desired. During the first two years of establishment, fruits should be removed. It is also important that the limbs are spread when they are young. If a limb is not spread to a 45 to 90 degree angle, a bark inclusion can develop. This occurs when the bark of the trunk and the branch have been pressed together. This structure weakens the branch and serves as an entry point for pathogens. A wide angle branch, however, allows for growth and expansion of both the trunk and the branch and produces a much stronger branch that can withstand future heavy crop loads. As mentioned in the previous slide, a more horizontally trained limb can withstand a heavier crop load, but there are other effects when the branch is trained from a vertical to a horizontal position. Vigor is reduced both in shoot growth and bud development as the limb grows more horizontally, but especially so with scaffolds below the horizontal plane. So developing the proper branch angle is really a balance between strengthening scaffold limbs and managing growth and productivity. On the previous slides, it was noted that a more horizontally trained limb can withstand a heavier crop load. An additional benefit of a horizontally trained limb is increased number of marked old fruits and in most cases will decrease the time to bear. Once fruit trees have been trained to a specific training system, 
The goal of annual pruning is to maintain that shape and to increase light penetration into the canopy and to improve fruit color and increase fruit bud formation for the next year's crop. The flower buds of apple tree fruit are initiated and partially developed in the season previous to their unfolding into blossoms. Most flowers on apple are located terminally on short shoots, also known as spurs, which you can see pictured at the top and center. The period generally considered to be the time of most apple flower bud formation spans the three to six weeks after bloom, but may be influenced over a much longer period of time. Peach trees bear fruit laterally on wood that grew the previous year as pictured in the bottom center. The ability to identify flower buds is important in order to prevent the removal of too many. Flower buds are easily recognized by their shape. They are larger than leaf buds and are swollen near the base. In contrast, leaf buds are smaller and narrow. Apple trees generally bear flower buds at their tips of spurs and short shoots. It is important not to prune off these short shoots since they are the site of future flower buds. Flower buds of the peach are plump and roundish. The leaf or shoot buds are small, narrow, and pointed. On vigorous shoots, flower buds at a given node may occur in numbers of one, two, or three. Where three buds are at a node, as pictured above, the usual arrangement is for the center bud to be a leaf bud while the outer buds are flower buds. On the shorter growth and spurs, flower buds are often born singly beside a leaf bud. On very vigorous shoots, the buds may consist almost entirely of leaf buds. Nutritional requirement of fruit trees differ from those in agronomic crops and the orchard floor. Because fruit trees are perennial in nature, leaf or foliar analysis is recommended every three years to provide the most accurate information to determine nutritional needs of an orchard beyond the initial pre-plant fertilizer recommendation. Soil analysis are not nearly as accurate in determining the nutritional status of the orchard because factors such as rootstock, crop load, soil type, and weather conditions influence whether or not trees are absorbing enough nutrients to produce maximum yields. The main value of a soil test is to monitor the soil pH. Removing a portion of the crop results in increased size and quality for the remaining crop. The earlier the crop is thinned, the greater the decrease in fruit size. For some crops, such as Golden Delicious apples, the tendency towards alternate bearing is very strong and annual thinning is a method to reduce that cycle. Depending on the type and variety of fruit, fruit clusters should be broken up, leaving a single fruit. Apple and peach should be spaced from 6 to 8 inches apart on limbs. Hand thinning is the most labor-intensive option and should be reserved as a final step in thinning to save time and labor cost. Hand thinning is appropriate for apples and peaches. Clubbing limbs or clusters is a method where a padded pole or a plastic bat works well. With them, limbs can be struck hard enough to knock off some fruit, yet not so hard that branches will be damaged. Thinning in this manner is much quicker than hand thinning, though not as precise. It may be necessary to follow up thinning in this manner, either by hand thinning to break up clusters of fruit, or by using a stick with a short piece of hose on the end to strike the cluster and dislodge some of the fruit. Best results from thinning using this method will be obtained in early morning or late evening when fruit stems are firm. Thinning in this manner is generally done when the largest fruit are between the size of a dime and a nickel. This method is more common in peaches, but can be used in apples. Chemical thinning is almost exclusively used in apples. Commercial apple growers can spray their trees at the appropriate time with certain chemicals, which will cause some fruit to drop. It is a very precise operation and either no thinning or over thinning can result. Good results depend on selection of the correct chemical, rate, and time of application. Weather conditions before, during, and after application can influence results. 
When done properly, chemical thinning gives the best results of all the methods used, since it's done earlier than the others. Chemical thinning is also the least expensive method. Thinning usually requires several steps. In the case of peaches, the first thinning pass would be a bloom thinner, using ropes drug through the tree, or a string thinner. If additional crop still needs to be removed, branches may be clubbed later when fruit are small and at a stage when they more easily detach from the tree, referred to as being loose. The final crop density is set by hand thinning. Apples are the most responsive to chemical thinners, whereas other fruit crops for the most part rely on mechanical means to thin. There is not just one recipe to chemical thin because too many factors influence the tree's reaction to thinners. To get started, the following resources are recommended for apple growers thinking about using chemical thinners in their operation. If you plan to be an organic apple grower, there is an option for you in terms of chemical thinners, and that is liquid lime sulfur. The other thinning agents listed are not accepted for organic certification. Each thinning agent has an optimal application window, and as you can see from the chart, most chemical thinning is done between petal fall and 15 millimeter fruit size. Whether your fruit production system will be certified organic or conventional, pest management is a significant component of all fruit production, and most especially tree fruit production. Throughout your upcoming session, pests of tree fruit and the integrated pest management approach to manage them will be further discussed. Shown here are just a scant few of the resources available on the web to further your understanding of fruit production. Listed here are contacts at University of Illinois Extension should you have additional questions related to fruit production.